your hands together for the Lord and celebrate them. Come on. Love your hands, everybody.
this morning, if you are alive in Christ and the resurrection power is at work in you, why don't you lift up your voice and give a shout of victory? Hallelujah. God is up to something in our lives. With that same sense of conviction, we want to come before the Lord in prayer this morning and want to intercede for our continent. We are declaring that Africa is coming out of obscurity into a season of economic transformation, financial breakthrough, and honor. The name of our continent will be mentioned with honor across the continents of the world. Lift up your voice. Let's pray together. In the mighty name of Jesus, we declare that Africa is rising. We declare that your favor is spreading across the continent from the north to the south and from the east to the west. We declare a season of economic transformation, new opportunities and new inventions. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, new treaties and new opportunities, new access for the continent. In the name of Jesus, the world order is being reviewed in favor of Africa. We declare in Jesus' name that in this season, Africa is rising. In the mighty name of Jesus, we speak prosperity. We speak advancement. We speak growth and increase. In the mighty name of Jesus, in various sectors of our nation, we speak growth and increase extension of the boundaries of our influence as a continent in the mighty name of the lord jesus christ we declare honor for this continent this continent is great and mighty in the mighty name of the lord jesus we declare that africa is rising and africa is moving forward we are taking our place in the mighty name of jesus we thank you heavenly father for this continent for economic transformation and for prosperity we give a praise for this continent for a season of honor a season of upliftment for the continent in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For everything that God will do with our continent, the church is a very pivotal part of it. As so we are praying that the church will be the voice of hope in Africa. And we are declaring that the power of the gospel will break every stronghold of inferiority and stagnation. Lift up a voice, let's pray together in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that the church is the hope of the continent. We declare in the name of Jesus that the gospel will break every power of inferiority across the continent, that the gospel will cause people to rise up with confidence and honor in the mighty name of Jesus. Every thinking pattern, every stronghold of inferiority, we declare it is broken, it is broken by the power and by the entrance of the gospel in the mighty name of Jesus. Wherever the gospel is preached, we declare that strongholds are being broken and destroyed forever in the mighty name of Jesus. This continent is rising because the church is moving forward. In the mighty name of Jesus, let the gospel extend across the boundaries of different nations, bringing light, bringing life, bringing hope, bringing transformation to this continent. We thank you for the power of the gospel and declare that the continent is rising because the gospel is moving forward. In the mighty name of Jesus, Africa will rise. In the mighty name of Jesus, the church is moving forward and the continent is rising. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. In the mighty name of Jesus. Finally, you want to thank God for the victory that you have over sickness and disease and infirmity. And you are claiming the blessing of healing and perfect health for every single member of your family. In Jesus' name, lift up a voice. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for healing. We thank you for health. We thank you that you sent forth your word and it healed them. This morning, we join our hearts together and we join our faith together. And declare that every member of every family represented here is walking in healing and perfect health. In the name of Jesus, we speak to every sickness, every infirmity, every disease. We speak to people on admission in hospitals and declare that the power of the word, the power of the Holy Spirit is touching them now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we speak healing and health. We declare that families shall have testimonies of transformation, testimonies of healing, testimonies of restoration of their health in the mighty name of Jesus. Every family represented here, we declare that every member shall enjoy health and they shall enjoy healing in the mighty name of Jesus. Touch every sick member in the name of Jesus, wherever they are. Touch them by the power of your spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. We give you praise for healing. We give you praise for our continent. We give you praise for the church of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. Church, in the book of Luke 16 and the verse 16, Bible says that since the days of John, 
the gospel is preached and everywhere men press into it. This morning with that conviction in our hearts, we want to join endless praise as we sing the hymn, Whosoever Will. came to the Lord with infirmity, we came with weakness, we came with pain, but he lifted us up and made us kings and queens, and today we have a testimony of the goodness and of the grace of the Lord. Why don't you put your hands together and give God praise for his faithfulness in your life. In Jesus' mighty name, kindly be seated. On behalf of Dr. And Mrs. Utabel, it gives me great joy to welcome you to Christ Temple of the International Central Gospel Church. And to this beautiful Sunday morning, we are gathered unto the Lord with great expectation that today he will visit us by the power of his word and lift our lives to a whole new level. We want to take a minute to welcome all those joining us from the various continents of the world and trust that God's word will be a blessing to you. It's now time for us to love the Lord, celebrate him and honor him with our giving a time to give is a time of honor, it is a time of purpose, and a time of deliberateness. 
and today, right um, on, in the pouch in front of you, offering envelopes have been provided as well as pens to enable you to fulfill your commitment appropriately. So check the pouch in front of you um, and you will find envelopes and pens provided. And as you fill out the details, meditate on 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 that says, But this I see, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. This morning, let your sowing be bountiful and let it be purposeful in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. For those in church or watching online willing to give digitally, please choose from the various options expressed on your envelope and also on the screen and go ahead and give digitally. Helping us to receive our offering with a song, Excess Love. Let's welcome new edition. Let's put our hands together as they come.
Your love is amazing. Your love is amazing. Your love is amazing. Take it up. Your grace is amazing. Your grace is amazing. Your grace is amazing. Your grace. Come on, say it. You're amazing. 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 You're Come on. Jesus, you love me too much, oh. I know that's a testimony. Come on. If you know that it had not been for the Lord, Jesus, you love me too much, oh. Let's get on. Too much, oh. Too much, oh. Celebrate the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you. We exalt your name, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. Wow. Let's appreciate new edition. We thank God for his love, his loving kindness, which is better than life. Just to remind us to tuck the pens back into the pouch after we use them. <laughs> so we will use them again next week. Thank you very much. It's part of the love of Christ. Amen. Church, right after this prayer with great expectation in our hearts, let's welcome our dear Pastor Dr. Mensa Otabu. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that your promise is secure. We thank you for how far you've brought us, your protection, your provision, and your power at work in our lives. And today, as we spoke in obedience, we are confident that the year 2019 will end well with us. Amen. That by the 31st of December, every family will have a testimony of your power and your provision. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen and amen and amen. Let's rise up together as we make our declaration of wisdom in this year of wisdom. Are you ready? Yes. Say with me, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. By wisdom, he has founded the earth. By understanding, he has established the heavens. The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Today... I incline my ear to the instruction of the Lord and my heart to his spirit. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. He is Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I have the mind of Christ. His word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Therefore, my steps are ordered in righteousness. On Christ the solid rock, I stand. His wisdom and knowledge are the stability of my life. Today, I declare the word of the Lord. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for me. I am blessed in Christ. Salvation, favor, and increase are mine. In Jesus' name, Amen! Hallelujah and hallelujah. You may kindly be seated in God's presence. And it's a great joy to have you in the house of God. Uh, it looks like the minor rainy season has become a major one. And uh, the rain has been pouring since dawn. And, uh, you know, there are people who are the salt of the earth. 
So when it rains, they, do, they, they feel they will melt. Uh, but thank God for those of you who were able to make it in church. Clap for yourself that uh, you came through the rain and you are able to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And just to reemphasize the uh, note that Pastor Albert made, uh, that the pens um, are not a gift to you. Uh, so please uh, honor the Lord and keep it uh, at the back uh, so that uh, next time you can use it again. Well, I, my wife and I have been uh, out for quite a bit, um, in and out, and I, I haven't preached for a few weeks, uh, so it's good to be back home uh, to the greatest church on the planet, Christ Temples, and, and be able to share with you uh, the word of God. Um, you, maybe you're wondering where we were. It's none of your business, my friend. When a man is uh, at my age, he can do whatever he wants. Uh, but we took some time off just to relax and, uh, and, and thank God. Amen. Well, uh, just came this morning to encourage you in the Lord and to encourage you with the word of God. And uh, I believe that um, God has something interesting in store for your life and you do something great with your life. And I believe that uh, every piece of your life will fall in the right place. My message is simply titled, God has a place for us. Everybody say, God has a place for me. Oh, why are you talking as if the rain has drowned your voice? Say, God has a place for me. Oh, let me say it like you mean it. Say, God has a place for me. It's a very important thing to say about your life. It's a very important thing to say about yourself that God has a place for you, that you are important to him, that you matter to him. Because many times we wonder where we fit in life. Uh, and whether we are important in life and whether we matter at all. Uh, because you can go through life many times and wonder whether your life is making any difference, whether you are making any impact, whether your life is significant and meaningful, whether the things you're going through have any meaning or any value. The writer of the book of Ecclesiastes struggled with that question uh, uh, for... for for much of the writing of the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, sometimes you get depressed when you read it um, because the writer looks at life with all its ups and downs. He looks at nature, the rising of the sun, the setting of the sun. He looks at all the things that happens to human beings and he begins to wonder whether God has any purpose in all of these things. And uh, without God and without seeing life from God's point of view, the writer says that the only conclusion you can make of life is that it's all vanity. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. In other words, it looks as if life is a waste of time. That is looking at life without God in the picture. But today we want to see that God has a place for us, that it's not all vanity of vanities. There is a purpose for your life. There is a meaning for your life. And I want to encourage you with that. And I pray that you live here today fully assured that God has a place in his plans for you. The first point I want to make is that God has a place for us in the world he has created. God has a place for us in the world he has created. You can personalize it and say, God has a place for me in the world he has created. Let's say that together. Say it one more time. Now, the world is a very huge place. There are so many people in this world. And only a few people know us. Uh, have you tried to count the number of people who know you in this world? I'm a relatively well-known person, probably more known than most of you. 
Uh, but even I go to places in the world and nobody knows me. There, there are places I go to and nobody knows me. You walk through the, if I walk through Accra, you know, I can go 10 meters uh, without somebody coming to shake my hand, introduce themselves, smile to me, say hi, pastor, or say something like that. Uh, if I go to a restaurant, I'm going to meet people uh, who know me. Uh, it's very difficult for, for me to operate in Ghana as a normal human being. But even with all of that, you know, I go to other parts of the world uh, and nobody knows me. I can go through a market and nobody knows me. Um, and I am pretty popular, but most of you are not that well known. I'm not criticizing you. I'm just saying you are not well known. Um, and, uh, and sometimes you wonder who knows me. Am I important to the world? Am I recognized in the world? Uh, I was reading some statistics and it was quite interesting to me that the average person uh, knows about 600 people. The average person knows about 600 people in their lives and is known by 600 people, averagely. Some people more, some people less, but averagely. The average person in their lifetime will make contact with about 80,000 people. That is from the time you were born to the people who were in your neighborhood, people you played with, people you went to school with, and so on and so forth. But in the end, only about 600 will remember you. Only 600. But the world has about almost 8 billion people. So in terms of people who know you, there are about 0 0.000075 people. You are a very, very unknown person. <laughs> so, now if you are in the world and, and people don't know you, you wonder, does God know me? Am I important? If people can't recognize me, people don't value me, am I important to God? And that's why I came here to tell you that God has a place for you in the world he has created. Psalm 22 verse 9 and 10 says, but you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Very interesting observations. It tells us that our birth was ordained by God. Our birth was ordained by God. You are he who took me out of the womb. Every day, over 350,000 people are born. Every day. So today, about that number of people will enter the earth. 240 babies are born every minute. The average person shares their birthday with between 20 to 21 million people on earth. So when you look at it, it seems like you are just one drop in the sea of many. But does God pay special attention to you? Well, the psalmist tells us that in the midst of all these numbers, God pays attention to you. God is not so confused by the number of people in the world that when he is looking for you, you get lost. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. So many people were being born at the same time I was born, but God knew I was entering the earth. He knew you were entering the earth. In the midst of the multitude, God sees the individual. He saw our birth, whether in a hospital, a clinic, a taxi, a train, or even in the rubbish dump. I don't know where you were born. I don't know the circumstances of your birth. But God says he took you out of your mother's womb. Oh, yes, of course, the doctors were there. Of course, there probably was a midwife. Of course, the, maybe you came through cesarean session or through some other means. But God says... In all of this, my hand was on you the day you entered this world. He is the one who took us out 
of our mother's womb. He is the one who introduced us into the world. But you are he who took me out of my mother's womb. Not only that, our calling and purpose in life comes from him. The passage says, you made me trust while on my mother's breast. That literally means that God stretched out his hand to us when we were born. Even when we didn't know him, he helped us to know that we were special. Very early in our lives, he made us trust him that we had something to do in this world. The awesomeness of God, he makes us trust him even when we were nothing. Have you ever had a conversation with children, young children, and uh, you ask them, what are you going to be? And each one of them confidently say something. Depending on their exposure in life at that time, some would say, I'll be uh, a president. And somebody would say, I'll be a boxer. That is, if at that time there is a boxer who is very popular or... You know, they can say, I want to be a marathoner because yesterday a marathoner broke the uh, two-hour uh, uh, time on the marathon. Uh, if, if, if the most popular person in the neighborhood is a charcoal seller, they will say, I want to sell charcoal. But, but why do children confidently say, when I grow up, I'll, I'll be this. I'll, when I grow up, I'll do that. Who gives them that confidence? To feel that in this world they can do something. They can make a difference. They can make an impact. The passage says God is the one who makes us trust even when we are little. That thing that makes you feel when you are young that your life matters, that you can change the world, that you can turn things around, it comes from God. He is the one who gives us the confidence even when we are nothing. And then the third thing he says in that passage, he says that I was cast out from upon you from birth. That means our lives depend on him. I love that verse. I was cast out or I was cast upon you from birth. The idea is something that is thrown away and lands on something. The psalmist is saying when life throws you away, you're going to be cast upon God. You will land on God. It's amazing how many times life would hit you, but the pastor says you'll land on God. Um, my mother used to tell me um, that when, when I was a baby, probably about three years old thereabout, I remember it vaguely. Very vaguely. You don't remember much of when you are three years old, do you? But, you know, things can happen that makes you remember. That. And, and I fell from a staircase, very high on the stairs. And I rode and rode and rode and rode and rode and rode and rode. And when I landed, everybody thought I was dead. Because there was blood everywhere. And they lifted me up. And uh, I had a cut in my forehead is still there. You won't see it now. You're too far away. Don't try to look at it. But it was there. It, it, forehead, it was bleeding. Took me to hospital. I was stitched up. And here am I. So why didn't I die from that fall from the staircase? The psalmist says, when life cast me out, I landed on God. And it's very important to know that many times you'll be cast out, but you land on him. You will land on him. And so he says, when, when life has cast me out, I land on God. Some of us were cast away from birth into a broken home, but we landed on the Lord. Nobody ever thought that that broken home will produce a whole person. Some of us were cast away into abuse and mistreatment, but we landed on the Lord. Some of us were cast into poverty, but look where we landed. 
Some of us were so sickly when we were children. Nobody ever thought we would survive. If you are here today, present in this house, it simply means life threw you away. But look where you landed. You landed on the Lord. Because there is a place for you in this world that God has created. I was cast, but I landed on the Lord. Many times when you hear people's testimonies and, and people have phenomenal testimonies, they tell you about their hardships and the homes they came through and people have very painful stories. Some have been uh, abused. Some unfortunately have been sexually abused, rape or beating or all kinds of things. And especially when you see a believer tell you, this is where my life was. And then look at where I've land landed. And the psalmist is telling us the only reason why you are still here today is because when you are cast away, you landed on God. Why did you land on him? Because there is a place for you in the world he has created. You are not here by accident. You are not here by chance. You are here because there is a place for you in God's world. The second thing I want to say is that there is a place for us in the book he has written. There is a place for us in the book he has written. There is a place for us in God's word. Psalm 139 verse 16 to 17. If you know your Bible well, you might have read this verse. Psalm 139, verse 16 to 17 says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts towards me, O God, how great is the sum of them. God has a place for us in the book he has written. Your eyes saw me, saw my substance being yet on form, and in your book they were all written. What you see from this passage is that God sees our potential before the potential becomes substance. God sees your potential before it becomes substance. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. God saw what I would be when I was not that. He sees our potential before it is realized. He sees in us what nobody sees in us. Have you ever asked yourself what God sees in you? God sees as a sculptor sees. A sculptor takes a piece of wood. And for you, maybe it's an old piece of wood. Maybe it's wood that was going to be burnt as firewood. But he takes that piece of wood and in that wood, he sees an image. And depending on how good the sculptor is, they can carve out a masterpiece out of wood that was just about to be burned. Or wood that had been thrown away and has been termite infested. Wood that nobody thought had any value, yet a sculptor sees it and sees an image that becomes a world-class masterpiece. I read an article recently, I'm not sure how valid it is, but uh, most of you know that the big Catholic cathedral in, in Paris, Notre Dame, uh, got burnt sometime this year, and the wood uh, that was used to construct the roof and the ceilings and so on uh, is very old wood. And um, it's difficult to go back and get wood from that era, 400, 500 years ago. And uh, somebody was suggesting that wood from Ghana 
can be used for that. Wow. Ghana can produce wood that is that old and can be used for that? Yes. Because, you know, when the Volta Lake was built, when the Akosumbo Dam was built uh, and they created the dam, the, a flood occurred. It created a flood and the flood covered a lot of forests. So in the Volta Dam are wood that have been submerged. There's a huge forest under the Volta Dam, under the Volta Lake of wood that has been submerged and is now high quality wood. Now the people who live around the Volta don't have any value for that wood, but can you imagine wood that we have no value for has value in high places. And, and that is how God sees it. Sometimes your life is like a piece of wood and, and nobody sees any value in you. They burn you, they throw you away, they, they use you for nothing and God sees you your substance yet unformed and he sees purpose in your life. I don't know what you see about your life, but God sees something in you that nobody else can see. That's why you cannot take people's impression of you as the standard for your life. You cannot say, nobody sees who I am, so I don't see who I am. Even if you don't see value, there is a master craftsman, his name is Jehovah, and when he sees you, you are not firewood to be burned. You are a masterpiece to be discovered. He says, your eyes saw me even when I was on form. I came here to tell somebody your greater years are ahead of you. Because God sees potential in you. He sees greatness in you. And not only does he see your potential before his substance, he has written about us in the word, in his word. The Bible is God's word to us. It's God's mirror to us. When we read the Bible, we see ourselves. The stories in the Bible are our stories. The people in the Bible are us. He has written about us. Yes, you would hear uh, of people like Abraham, and you hear of David, and you hear of Goliath, and you hear of Pharaoh, and you hear of Moses, but they are all you. He didn't write it for them. Those people cannot read. Moses cannot read his story. David cannot read his story. Abraham cannot read his story. Pharaoh cannot read his story. Esther cannot read her story. Hannah cannot read her story. So it wasn't written for them. It was written for you. Because their story is your story. In life, sometimes you, you are a David. And sometimes you are a Goliath. Oh, you think you're only David? Because sometimes you are the little person that God uses to do big things. And sometimes, unfortunately, we want to become the big things that intimidate the little people. And so when you read the Bible, God is writing about you. Avoid becoming a Goliath and be a David. It's a mirror of who you can become. It's a mirror of your potential. Don't be a Pharaoh, be a Moses. But there are people who are Pharaohs. There are people who try to imprison others. Unfortunately, sometimes even believers can become Pharaohs. Sometimes pastors can become Pharaohs. None of you is a Pharaoh. I know you're looking at me very, very disappointed and say, Pastor, please, I don't want to be a pharaoh. Yeah, I don't want you to be a pharaoh too. So when you see that potentially you are becoming pharaohic, <laughs> then you can repent and turn away from your pharaoh ways. If you're becoming a Goliath, you repent and say, I don't want to be a Goliath, I want to be a David. If you're becoming a Samson with a Delilah, you say, yeah, I want to be a Samson, but not with Delilah. I want to be a Samson that tears apart a lion. What kind of Samson do I want to be? What kind of a David do I want to be? Do I want to be a David with Bathsheba or a David who worships the Lord and dances before the Lord? Do I want to be a Moses who murders or a Moses who says to the powers that be, let my people go? 
God has written about you in his word. So anytime you read the Bible, you are, the stories are your stories. And in that, God is telling you, this is what you can become. This is whom I want you to be. This is where I want you to rise to. This is how I want you to deal with this situation. Because that story is not about the person I'm writing about. They are dead. They can't read it. It's about the living who can see themselves in the word of God. And claim for themselves what God has shown them. In his word. God has a place for us in the book he has written. Everybody say, God has a place for me in the book he has written. So when you read the Bible, you are not reading ancient literature. You are reading contemporary news of who you are and what you can be. And in his word, he has great and precious promises for us all the promises of God are for us he has promised us his presence he has promised us his help he has promised us his peace he has promised us his joy he has promised us his victory and when you read those promises they are not for the people who are dead it's for those of us who are alive that we can take hold of that which God has taken hold of us. So God has a place for us in the world he has created, in the word he has written, and God has a place for us in his work on earth. There is a place for us in what God is doing. God is working. Jesus said, my father works, and so I work. God didn't stop working. You know, many, many times people read uh, the, the account in the book of Genesis uh, that says God rested on the seventh day. And think that was it. He just, from there, he stopped working. No, he rested on the seventh day. He didn't stop working and he continues to work. He continues to work. God is still working. He's doing marvelous things in this world. And you want to see yourself as part of what God is doing. Your life here on earth is necessary. That's why you are here. Your life is in God's word. And there is a place for you in what God is doing. Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 to 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18 to 20. Matthew 21 to 2 says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. A landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard and he sent them into his vineyard. Vineyard. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 20. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are laborers in his vineyard. What a privilege it is to be employed by God. I don't know where everybody works in this place. Some of you work, uh, you do work for government, ministry of social, do we have social welfare still? Mobilization. Or you work for ministry of health, ministry of education. Or if you are in private business, maybe you work for MTN, Oh, uh, 
some other company. Or you work for Auntie Akosia in her shop. Or Mr. Blueman in his uh, fitting shop. Everybody works somewhere, and there's a place I work for, ICGC. But there, there are places that when you work at, you, 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 you go bragging about it. And there are places that when you work at, you don't want people to know. You like the pay, but you don't want anybody to know that's where you work. So I suppose if, if, if you work for Apple computers, Wherever the conversation is, without any link to Apple, you will bring Apple into the conversation. You say, you know, as, as they tell us in Apple every day when we go to work. <laughs> you, you will find a way to bring your workplace into the conversation. But if you work for PWD, I, I think you will avoid that conversation. You will say, as they tell us in PWD, you know, you just... <laughs> Public Works Department. <laughs> and, I, and I've known people who work in places or have worked in places, and every conversation they will bring, oh, you know, when I used to work here, and I, when I used to work for this, and when I used to work for the World Bank, and when I used to be in the IMF, when I, when I, when I used to work for Morgan Stanley, when I used to work for, um, uh, who are the big ones? What? And, and they quote those places. Oh, when I used to work for here, and when I used to work for there. And these are companies that are pretty nicely respected in the world. Some of them are old, some of them are very new. But the Bible says that beyond all of that, we work for somebody. And he created the guy who started Apple. And he created the earth we live in. He's called the Ancient of Days. You want to know what he produces. He produces the universe, the galaxies. He produces the stars, the moon. He produces solar systems. He produces rivers and mountains. And he produces human beings. He produces angels and archangels. He's a manufacturer of all of that. And you work for him. You work for him. And it's interesting that you didn't even apply for a job. How many times, I mean, if you try to apply for some of these big companies in the world, you go for interviews and interviews and interviews and interviews and finally tell you, we're sorry. But this big God who produces this spectacular world, the Bible says he came to recruit us. And he employed us to work for him in his vineyard. The greatest honor in the world is to work for God. You say, well, but uh, yes, you may work for PWD at one level, but if you've responded to the Lord and you love him, then you work for him. So if somebody asks you, where do you work? You can choose. You can say, well, I, I work for the ancient of days. I work for a guy who feeds the whole world. I work for a guy who made all things created all things and keeps everything operating. He operates the biggest manufacturing company, the biggest logistic company, the biggest human welfare and human interest company. By that time they're going to ask you, which company is that? 
It's God's company. And I like all these great people, Apple and all of that, but if they don't work for God, and they're not working for the superior one, they are nothing. But if you work for him, and you are partaking in his work on earth, that what is important to him is important to you, whom he wants to talk to, he uses you to talk to them. So when he wants to touch people's lives, he's going to say, go and touch their lives. He wants to encourage somebody, he's going to ask you, encourage them. He wants to change somebody's life, he's going to ask you, pray for them. So every day, we are working for him, the ruler of the universe. We are part of God's workforce. And don't ever underestimate it. That you are counted worthy to work for God. That you are counted worthy to be part of his labor force. And the interesting thing that 2 Corinthians tells us is that yes, we are laborers in his vineyard, but we are also his ambassadors. We are his accredited representatives. So when we walk, go out to work for him, there are privileges he gives us and immunities that he gives us. We are God's representatives, God's ambassadors. The work we do for him is important. If God wants to heal somebody, He's not going to tell Jeff Bezos. He doesn't know how to work for God. He's going to tell you. And he's going to tell you, go and pray for him, lay hands on him. Jeff Bezos cannot do that. Presidents of nations cannot do that. Very rich conglomerate leaders cannot do that. They don't even know how to pray. If you, if you tell them, pray, they'll say, pray what? They don't know how to pray. They don't know how to talk to God. They don't know how to pray for the sick. They don't know how to hear from God. But here you are. On earth, everybody says, oh, but you just work for PWD. But you hear from God. And when he wants to touch somebody, you are the one he talks to. When he wants to change something in the universe, you are the one he's going to wake up to pray and intercede for that to happen. You are a workman for him in his vineyard and an ambassador for him. Don't devalue your work for the Lord. The work we do for God is important. The service to him is the greatest thing on earth. Because in the end, in the final judgment, that is going to be the basis of human evaluation. What you did for God, not what you did for yourself or what you did for your country. It's good to save your country. But if you stand before God on judgment day, you're not going to say, Sir, Jehovah, I was an assembly man. In Ghana. I was an MP. I was voted by my constituents. God says, yeah, yeah that's, that's bad. That, that's, that's not bad. But that's not what I'm asking for. What did you do for me? When I spoke to you, did you hear? When I guided you, did you obey? When I wanted you to touch somebody's life, did you touch their lives? When I wanted you to pray, did you pray? When I wanted you to win souls, did you win souls? The work we do for God is the highest honor God places on us. And finally, not only do we have a place in God's work, word, world and his word and his work, finally, God has a place for us in the new world he's preparing. He has a place for us in the new world he's preparing. That is 
the ultimate. John chapter 14, verse 2 to 4. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. I like that. Where I go, you know, and the way you know. We have a glorious future with Christ. There is a place for us in God's new world. This is one of the areas where people joke with life. Earth is nice. Earth is nice, believe you me. Earth is nice. This, this world is a nice place. Especially when you have money. When you don't have money, this world is not nice. But when you have money, and you have influence. This world can be a really nice place. You can live in nice mansions, have the best of technology, drive the nicest cars, fly the best planes, your own plane. And don't let anybody fool you. Having your own plane is nice. Only that you don't have it. So you can criticize those who have it. But having one is nice. I'm telling you, when you don't go to seat number so and so and so, this is your own play and you go and sit in it. And especially if it has a shower in it, it has a bed in it. Hey. It's nice. So when you hear people say, I, you, who, why are you using private jet? Who, who should use it? It's nice. It's nice. I don't have one, but it's nice. I'll have one, yes. It's good to live in a nice house. I don't know about you, but I mean, if, you, if you live in a nice house and there is all kinds of marble and things on the floor, oh my goodness, that's enjoyable. You eat good food. Do you know that the Good food is always small, and bad food is always a lot. <laughs> As the, the, the higher the quality of the food, the less the portion. But the more depressing the food is, the large it is. So you eat the gari and you eat the kenke, you eat fufu big, and you say that's good life. No, no, that's terrible life. Good, good food is always small. It's good to have good life on earth. Believe you me. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, it's not good. Good clothes, good shoes, it's nice. But how long can you enjoy all of that? The jet planes and the good food. How many years? Maximum 70, 80, 90. Finished. And when you die, and they even put the food in your coffin, you can't eat it. They can put you in your plane, you wouldn't see it. But from the day you shut your eyes on this earth, you are introduced to another world for eternity. It's not one year, it's not 70, it's not 100, it's not 1,000, it's not 2,000 years, it's not 10,000, it's not a million years, it's not 2 billion years. Can you, can you imagine? I mean, we can't think of eternity. It's, you just keep going. And Jesus says, in that world of eternity, where I came from to meet you in time, I'm going back to eternity. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And the place he's preparing for you, he says, it's in my father's house. And there are mansions. And I will come for you and take you to that place. I don't know if I have to trade between that one and all the pleasures of this world, then all the pleasures of this world are nothing. So he says, what shall it profit a man if he gains 
the whole world, the jet, the good food and everything. And for eternity, it's tormented. Tormented. We have a place in the new world that God is preparing. And that's the assurance of the believer to know I have a place not only in this world, but in the world to come. There is a place for the believer. And it's greater than any mansion here on earth. And that city of God in Father's house, the streets, just as an introduction, the streets are made of pure gold, not gold, pure gold that is crystal the reason why the, the the writer of the book of revelation uses like 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 is because he's seen things never seen on earth so it's, it's like gold but that is clear so whatever that is we don't know but that is the street i'm telling you if they get one kilometer of that road Sometimes if we pray, say, Lord, just give me one kilometer, just give me one kilometer here on earth of that street of gold. It's greater than all the wealth of every company and every economy. And that's just the street leading to your home. That's your quota. So if the streets are like that, can you imagine the mansions? We have a place in this world, but that's not the end. We have a place also in that one. In God's future for us. We have a mansion with him. So if you're wondering, am I important in this world? Oh yes, you are. You have a place in this world that God has created. You belong here. You have a place in the word of God. When you read the Bible, you see yourself. You have a place in what God is doing. You are part of the greatest company ever. You are an employee of Jehovah God. And when all is done, you have a place in the new world. That he's creating. The Bible says this world will melt away. The heavens will melt away. And there will be a new world. And a new heavens. And you have a place there. You have a place there if you're a believer. Somebody say I belong. Say I'm worthy. Say I'm important to God. I have a place. In God's mind. The psalmist who wrote the eighth psalm says, when I consider the heavens and the earth and all the things you've created and, and all the majesty of all this creation. And then he says, I look at the one you pay attention to. He says, what is man that you are mindful of? And you're always thinking about him. What is man that you should visit him? I mean, you are going on a visit. Why don't you go to Pluto? Why don't you go to some galaxy? Why? But, but you're going to these crazy, inconsistent people who deny you and hate you and never even trust you enough. But you are always thinking about them. And you always want to visit them. Because in God's mind, of all the things that he has, he has made, there is nothing as precious as you. You are important to God. You are important to the world he has created. He is important to his world. You are important to his word. You are important in his work. And that's why he goes to that length to prepare a place for you. This morning, if you don't know God properly and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you just a few minutes before I shut down. For you to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. For Jesus to come into your life. You know many times. 
uh, people come to church and they assume, oh, because I come to church, I'm a believer. It's good to come to church. And you maybe have been coming to this church for a very long time, maybe for one year, two years, but in your heart, you know Christ is not there. How do you know Christ is in your heart? It's not just because you just prayed and said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. But when he comes into your heart, there will be a mark of a before and after. If you come to church and there is no before and after in your life, there is no once I was this, but now I am that. that there is no change. There is no transformation. Then you have to start looking at your salvation and your commitment to the Lord deeper. If you are here and you are not sure that Christ is in your heart, you have to be sure. Some, somebody will say, well, Pastor, but I came forward the other time. It's not about coming forward. It's about Jesus being in your heart. And if you are not sure, you have to do it again until you are sure that he is in my heart. How do I know? Because he changed my life. He changed my life. Let's bow down our heads. If you are here and you want to be sure that your place in the new world is secure, that you're not going to spend eternity in darkness, eternity in hell, eternity separated from God, but you want to spend eternity with Christ Jesus, with him as your Lord and Savior, if that is your prayer and your desire, Wherever you are seated, in the auditorium, in the balconies, in the overflow areas, just lift up your right hand to God as a sign that you want to give your life to Jesus. Let your hand go up. Don't feel embarrassed because you are determining your future, your eternity. Let your hand go up. Let your hand go up. I see some hands in the balconies, wherever. Let your hand go up. If Christ comes into your life, there will be a change. There will be a transformation. For those of you with your right hand up, I'm going to ask you to take a second step. Rise up from where you are and come to the front. Come to the front with me. Come to the front right now. Come. Don't leave anything on your seat. Pick your Bible. Pick your bag. Don't leave anything on your seat. Just come to the front. Just come to the front. If you are not sure of your salvation, you are not sure whether you are saved or not, still join them. Come to the front. You need to be sure. You need to be sure. Eternity is too long to be doubtful over. Eternity is too long to joke with. God bless you. God bless you. Listen to me, my friends. There is power in Christ to forgive us of every sin. The only thing he says is that we have to be sorry and, and repent. Turn away from those sins. And he says, if you do, I will also turn away from your sins. He will wash away your sins. Cleanse you. And come to live in your heart. For some people, Christ comes to live in their heart when they are young. For some people, when they are old. But one day in your life, if you want to be sure of going to heaven, one day in your life, you have to, by your own choice, give your life to Jesus. And that's what you have come to do today. Today is the beginning of a new life for you. I want you to lift up your hand to God as a sign of surrender. And I want you to start talking to God and ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to wash you and cleanse you with the blood of Jesus. Ask him. Uh, just say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Just talk to him. Ask him. You know yourself.
I'm going to pray with you. And I want you to say this prayer with me from your heart. Say with me, Heavenly Father. Let everybody say that prayer, the whole church. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. I am a sinner. I have sinned against you. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. Make me a brand new person. From today, I open my heart to you. Come into my heart. Save me. Deliver me. I have decided today to follow you and to serve you all the days of my life. I thank you, Father, for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you very much. Look at me. If you pray that prayer from your heart, the only promise I can give you is what the Bible says. Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. And the scripture says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I declare to you today that all your sins have been forgiven. You have been made a brand new person in Christ. And from today, the old has passed away and all things have become new. Go and live the new life that Christ has given to you. Amen. And amen. God bless you. I want you to follow this gentleman here with his hand up and they will take you out and talk to you briefly. Encourage them as they go and start their new life in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and tell them I'm important to God. Amen. Well, we're going to give our projects offering. As you know, uh, this offering is very important for our new building auditorium. Uh, we're going to show you pictures very soon. Um, so much is happening there, but it happens because you make it happen and because of your giving and your consistency. So just want to encourage you to be consistent, to be faithful to the promise you have made. And uh, let's see that building concluded to God's glory. Amen. Uh, the band will be ministering and as the band ministers uh, you give cheerfully as the Lord has blessed you
have done in this volume is that I have done what it will be called a Bible survey of the subject of tithes, offerings, and first fruits. And I just want to commend it to you as a Christian. Both the book and the Q&A uh, parts are available. Get them, read them, study them. Tithes, offerings, and first fruits. Grab your copy from Alta Bookshop, Christ Temple, Amazon.com, or call plus 233-548-416-930. This November at Christ Temple, Life Improvement Seminars 2019. Theme, Preparing for the Future. Building your asset base. Building your finance base. Building your career base. Every Tuesday in November. Do you have questions about God? Are you seeking a clearer understanding of who God is? Do you want definite answers to the questions people often ask about your faith? Join us every Tuesday in the month of October as we answer these questions which affirm and defend our Christian faith. Tuesday 15th October Topic The existence of God and evil Why does a good God allow evil, pain and suffering in the world? If God is omnipotent, why does he not stop evil and pain in the world? Guest Minister Dr. Kwesi Boating, Daniel Institute, Tuesday, 22nd October. Topic, God and Eternity. Why will a good God punish people for eternity? Why must people suffer eternally for committing temporary sins? Guest Minister, Dr. Kwesi Boating, Daniel Institute, Tuesday, 29th October. It's a day of consecration and fasting. Make time to come through Christ Temple to pray anytime from 9 a.m. To 4 p.m. as we build up to the evening's communion service. Corporate prayer is from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Communion service from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Song ministrations by Pastor Ella, Jane Akambu, Arabella Aqua, Kweku Dapa, and Seraphs. Wisdom is the principal thing, and in all you're getting, get understanding. Praise God. What an incredible time in God's word. Let's appreciate the word of God. Thank you so much, Pastor. Tell your neighbor God has a place for you. Kindly give me your attention for these reminders. On behalf of Dr. and Mrs. Otabella, I'd like to welcome all those worshiping in Christ's temple for the very first time here on a Sunday. You may have come through any of our events or experience portable on TV or radio, but if this is your first Sunday in Christ's temple, please rise to your feet so we all can appreciate you. <laughs> encourage them, encourage them. God bless you so much. Thank you for choosing Christ's temple. We are honored to have you. You are being given a package from the church. If you have received yours, you may be seated. Next week, Sunday, we'd like you to be our guest in an interactive reception after the first service at 9.40 to 10 o'clock and after the second service at 12.40 to 1 p.m. Ahead of that, please look in your package and fill the Let's Connect card and give it to the ushers or leave it at the front desk before you leave. Just a reminder that our exciting times of instruction in God's Word continue on Tuesday and this Tuesday, please, if for any reason you've missed out on the first two, make a date on Tuesday as we look at the existence of God and evil. The time is 6 p.m. and come with your difficult questions and let's trust God for answers from the scriptures. It's been a great time in God's presence and as a mark of our appreciation, why don't you rise to your feet together as we welcome Pastor Mensah Utabel to close the service. Let's put our hands together in appreciation as he comes. Let's receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. The Lord establish you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The Lord make you the head and not the tail. The Lord go before you and make a straight path before you. This week, may you function as a person who belongs to God. 
May you function in your workplace for God. May you function in his word. May his word become real to you. Let the promises of God be fulfilled in your life. May the Lord raise you to the place he has appointed to you. May he cause your substance to be seen and your potential to be fulfilled. And go from this place with this confidence and assurance that in Christ Jesus you are more than a conqueror. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you on Tuesday night.
the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. message from Elijah to Elisha and this is part number two um, my subtitle is becoming a student last week I talked about becoming a servant becoming a student this is part a of becoming a student and then I will do part B of becoming a student but this part is very important uh, in understanding how to receive an impartation or a transference of leadership. It's critical. One of the challenges we find uh, around us, uh, both spiritually and in the secular world, people complaining that we are not able to transfer uh, wealth or, or success from one generation to the other. And so you have businesses that are successful in one generation and the next generation messes up. And, and, and the same thing happens sometimes in churches. And what I'm teaching is to address that because we want to see transgenerational success stories. And one of the th lessons we learned from Elijah to Elisha uh, is becoming a student. I have come to the conclusion that there are servants who never grow to be sons and there are sons who never learn to be servants. And it's one of the main reasons why wealth and success is not transferred. And I hope that this uh, will help you in your own uh, understanding of how to rise to that place of leadership through impartation. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 21, we read it last week, but uh, we would emphasize on it a little bit more as we talk about this part of the message. So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. I want to focus on the last sentence. Then he arose and followed Elijah. Then he arose and followed Elijah. One of the ways in which leaders were raised uh, was through the process of following or the process of discipling or raising of students. So I would just want to explain a little bit the word follow and what it means. Three uh, definitions uh, for the word follow. One, it means to walk behind another. To follow is to walk behind another. To follow requires that there should be someone ahead of or in front of you. It means to take steps that another has already taken. You cannot follow when you are in the lead. If you are going to follow, you have to be behind. Becoming a student requires following. Secondly, to follow means to imitate another's ways. To follow is to imitate. It requires watching someone closely and doing what they do. And that is how we all learned from the most accomplished master in any field. You would learn that each one of us started by imitation. The most proficient speaker, eloquent orator, started by imitating sounds and words from another person. The greatest instrumentalist, whether a violinist, started by imitating somebody and playing uh, very routine 
uh, 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 notes. It's, it's interesting now that I'm grandparenting uh, to, uh, you know, to watch my grandchildren learning ba, ba, black sheep and all these uh, uh, rhymes all over again, twinkle, little, twinkle, twinkle, little stars. Now I have to learn them all over and sit through twinkle, twinkle, little stars. But 40 years from now, they will be propounding great theories and great ideas and I don't know what they will become, but it all started with twinkle, twinkle, little stars, ba, ba, black sheep, one, two, three, four, and even that counting sequence is like, uh, it's a huge task. What am I saying? We all learn by imitation. If you're going to be a great leader, you have to learn to imitate. To follow means to go where another is going. To follow is to go where someone else is going. When you're following, you don't go where you want to go. You go where you are being led to go. Elisha started his journey into leadership by following Elijah. He became his student. He became 